Irrigation, noun, one. The supply of water to land or crops to help growth, typically by means of channels, such as a sprinkler. Two, the process of cleaning out a wound or organ using a continuous flow of water or medication. I'd say we certainly saw both instances of irrigation in this episode. Hi, I'm Courtney. You're watching Courtney's Reviews. And if you are not yet caught up to Season 6, Episode 12, Waterworks, this is your opportunity to click off because major spoilers ahead. All right, got a lot to say about this one, so join me for my breakdown. So if I had to sum up this episode in just a couple of words, I would say that it is a study in the effects of trauma on a human being. If Jimmy is Frankenstein, Kim is a zombie. And in this episode, we get to see how trauma has affected both of these characters and what it does to them. So one of the similarities is that they both put on a mask, right? They put on a mask and they retreat from themselves. They recede from themselves. Um, Kim retreats inward and Jimmy, we see, reacts outward, right? The showrunners kept teasing that perhaps that there were fates worse than death. If you have been following me for a while, you know that my longest standing prediction for this season was that Kim would end up behind bars in some way. And as I note in that video, and as Walt tells Jesse, um, there is more than one kind of prison. And we see Kim in this self-imposed prison, right? She is punishing herself. And as we find out um, later in the episode, when she goes uh, to speak with Cheryl, there's also now the possibility of like actual prison, although that may be unlikely. We'll have to wait to see what happens in the next episode. And this version of Kim that we see at the beginning of this episode is like the polar opposite of the Kim that we've we've known, right? Kim that we've known is assertive and is not afraid to voice her opinions and feels very strongly about things. And this version of Kim is an echo. She just echoes back everything said to her, afraid to actually share an opinion or make a decision about anything. And on the Insider podcast, they talked about how Vince Gilligan talked, spoke about how he thinks that she's afraid to make decisions um, because of how harmful her decisions in the past have been. And that really comes through very, very clearly in this episode. So a couple of different characters uh, ask her what she thinks about something. I don't know. You think this will work? I mean, technically it isn't actually mayonnaise, but... Yeah. Technically, I don't think this is mayonnaise. But close, right? What do you think? Should we give it a shot? I don't know. What do you think? She gives very bland, disinterested responses and often just echoes back whatever is said to her. You think they ever ran with the bulls on this show? Like in Spain? Not that we've seen, I don't think. Maybe it's too dangerous. What do you think? Maybe. Um, a coworker asks, um, you know, if she thinks they should pick up vanilla or strawberry ice cream. They're both good, right? Uh, she's she's not big on voicing opinions, and this life that she is living is essentially the life that she was hoping to avoid when she left Red Cloud. So when she's interviewing with Schweikart and Coakley, she notes that uh, she um, she wanted more, right? And like the best case scenario had she stayed in Nebraska would have been... Best case? Probably married to the guy that ran the town gas station. <laughs> Maybe cashiering down at the Hinky Dinky. The Hinky what? Hinky Dinky. Marrying the gas station manager... Um, and maybe cashiering at the hinky dinky, right? So not that there's anything wrong with that kind of lifestyle, but Kim wanted more. What did you want? More. And with someone as as talented and as ambitious as she is, it would it would be a waste of her talents. To, to live and lead that kind of lifestyle. And we see here that that is exactly the kind of lifestyle that she has instead chosen 
to to lead. Now, I want to take a look a little bit more closely at some of these scenes. In this opening scene, as she's cutting the potato and her boyfriend comes in and says they didn't have Duke's mayonnaise and he got Miracle Whip instead, you know, Miracle Whip is definitely not mayonnaise. And mayonnaise, perhaps being... um. And, and mayonnaise is like slang for like bland, right? So if something is mayonnaise, it's it's uninteresting. It's it's a, it's a bland condiment. And I think it's a commentary on just how bland Kim's new lifestyle is. Like it's not even it's not even interesting enough to be mayonnaise. It's Miracle Whip. So she has this uh, new Miracle Whip boyfriend who um, couldn't be more opposite of her ex husband Jimmy McGill, and. Something else that stood out to me in these uh, opening scenes with Kim is Jimmy's absence is extremely present. And there's a lot of absences throughout this episode. So um, when she walks outside and they're having this barbecue, we hear the Pina Colada song playing, right? And you'll remember that uh, when he is trying to film um, his commercial. He goes to the elementary school and makes up a story about how Rupert Holmes used to go there and, uh, you know, the Pina Colada song guy, and he starts singing it a little bit, right? So that is a callback to Jimmy, of course, and his sort of bon vivant ways, right? Now, listen very closely to the conversation that the men are having and also listen to the lyrics of the song. Oxy. Oxy. He's yellows. You hit it with enough no, sun. He's right. He's, no, he's right. Oh, if you just use a dark enough floor. Guys, I'm telling you, we're never going to settle this. I've been having this argument five days a week, but now I'm Sweden. Switzerland. Switzerland. So Kim's boyfriend mistakes Sweden for Switzerland, and you hear the part of the song where it says, and if you have half a brain, right? So not to, no disrespect to the new boyfriend, but he is no Jimmy McGill. If you like pina coladas, getting caught in the rain. If you're not into yoga, and you got half a brain. If you like making love at midnight. And again, I think the way that they laid in the song and the sort of dialogue that we are hearing is really meant to highlight just how black and white Kim's world has become in terms of contrast from her previous life. And in this scene, we see that that the men and the women are are segregated and they're talking amongst themselves and it's small talk and it's couldn't be perhaps less stimulating for someone like Kim. Um, and it's, it's such a different world from what she is used to. Now, as I was watching this, I was reminded of the film Edward Scissorhands. If you haven't seen it, it's set in Florida as well. And, or at least it was filmed in Florida. I don't know if it's supposed to be set in Florida, but, uh, you get this sort of a very similar, um, feeling where like all the houses are sort of cookie cutter. Everything is the same. And you see that men and women are segregated, um, talking amongst themselves. And it's this very sort of like, uh, very traditional suburban Americana, right? Not that there's anything wrong with this, right? A lot of people live like this and there's there's nothing wrong with it, but it's just such a stark contrast to how Kim is, is used to living. And we're used to seeing her in charge and more assertive. And here she's playing this more subservient housewife type. And uh, maybe Edward is uh, the one who uh, gave her her new hairstyle. And to further highlight just how how different this is from her previous life, um, after the party ends, uh, they're in the kitchen. And as her boyfriend is taking out the garbage, he remarks, this was fun. And Kim echoes, yeah, this was fun. And one of the last things we heard her say to Jimmy, of course, was that she was having too much fun. So Kim's uh, previous idea of fun was you know, pulling cons with, with Jimmy. And now she is, uh, you know, doing backyard barbecues and talking about food coloring and the amazing race and things like that. And I got the sense from her that she needs the distractions, right? So like, you know, as I was watching this the first time, I was like, you know, I, I might, if it were me in her shoes, I might almost prefer to be alone than to live that kind of life. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but just based on like who she is and where she's coming from to to adopt a lifestyle like this must be horrible. Because as she even says to Rich in her interview, this is exactly what she didn't want, right? This is what she was trying to avoid. And now she's 
embraced it completely. So upon thinking about it a little bit more, it seems to me that she can't stand the silence, right? So she needs this these distractions. And um, the sex scene couldn't be any less romantic. And not that we've, we've seen a lot of um, sex scenes between her and Jimmy, but the ones that we have seen are passionate and romantic. And if you see the, if you saw the little music video tribute that I made to them, I have some of the clips in that. And it's just such a, a it's such a stark contrast between um, her, her romance with Jimmy and her romance with this guy. And, uh, and again, that just, uh, it reminds us again of, of Jimmy's absence in her life. And so as her boyfriend is watching the amazing race on TV and, you know, making sort of meaningless uh, remarks about it, we see Kim is sitting there completing a blank puzzle, right? So a blank puzzle, um, perhaps a metaphor for the blankness of her life. Um, and also just the fact that it, it, a puzzle like that would be incredibly difficult to complete because all it's all one color. It's a uniform color. So having to find the correct shapes, right? It's all about finding the correct shapes. And as she walks her boyfriend out for him to leave, they remark that it looks like rain again. And then he says that they opened up a new <laughs> outback and satellite beach. You want to try it? And she's like, sure. And this uh, this stood out to me because it doesn't matter where you are in the country. Outback is outback. Every outback is the same. You know, I don't think a Bloomin' Onion and Satellite Beach tastes any, any different from a Bloomin' Onion in Albuquerque or in New York City, right? It's going to be the same. So the fact that that's kind of like the highlight of her life is like going to try a new outback where it's just like any other outback is, uh, I think, um, is telling. I love Bloomin' Onion. But anyway, as I as I noted that um, the, these scenes are largely marked by Jimmy's absence. So his absence is a presence. So uh, I'm not going to get into like Duridian traces here, but the idea of what it, you're not shown, the, this, um, this process of differentiation reminds us of what is actually missing. So in the following scenes, we see Kim brushing her teeth by herself and every other time we've ever seen her brush her teeth, and we've seen this, uh, this sort of scene many times throughout the series, it's always Jimmy standing next to her. It's like Jimmy and Kim brushing their teeth is to what uh, Skylar, Walt, and Walt Jr. eating breakfast is in Breaking Bad. It's like the most normal routine thing that they do together as, as a family, as a couple. And then we see her um, get into bed and she's sleeping on the same side of the bed that she slept on when she was with Jimmy. And that she's off to the side almost makes it seem like she's leaving space for him. And then we see um, where she works. She works at the sprinkler store, right? And we get a sense of her her job and what she does and her office. And it reminds me of um, a little bit of Beneke, right? So like that sort of office setting, um, the way like people are chatting and like celebrating birthdays and things like that, you know, um, typical sort of office culture that you would might find at any number of, of businesses across uh, the United States. And we see that she's uh, using her real name. So it's not like she's uh, assumed a different name. She's still using Kim Wexler. Um, but you see that her her name has been printed out using a label maker. Um, and that's that's quite a, a, a far cry from her digs at uh, like Schweikart and Coakley. And um, then, of course, we get to see her side of the conversation that we um, saw from Jimmy's point of view in the previous episode when he smashes the phone booth. And uh, he uh, he calls and he gives the name Victor Sinclair. And you'll recall that Victor Sinclair was the name that they um, that he would use when they were playing like their little scams on people. So, for instance, in season two, episode one, Switch, when they con um, Ken into buying them the, the bottle of tequila, that's the name he gives. And she goes by Giselle Sinclair. So she immediately recognizes that it's him. She closes her blinds, etc. And um, 
this scene is really interesting, especially having seen what happened with um, with Jean's side of the conversation and his reaction to it. I was so curious what she said to him to make him react in such a a violent, enraged way. And you can see that, you know, she's she's very quiet and soft spoken here. But um, I love this scene, and it's the first time that we actually see Kim express any sort of opinion. So he asks her to say something, and then we get this slow push in of the camera, and she says, um, you want me to say something? You should turn yourself in. She voices an opinion for the first time this whole episode. You should turn yourself in. And he calls her out, right? He sort of points out, the hypocrisy of how um, who is she to tell him what he should do when she could turn herself in. And then he clarifies a couple of points for her that uh, that Lalo is dead. Mike is dead. Gus is dead. So there's no fear of reprisal that someone might come for them if she co goes forward. And he also says that they can only hang him once. So, you know, don't hold back on his account. So I think he gave her everything that she really needed to move forward at this point. And I actually think that the only reason she hadn't gone forward earlier was was because she maybe perhaps felt that she was protecting Jimmy and maybe also a little bit afraid of the cartel perhaps. But really, I think it's she wanted to protect Jimmy. And he is a very wanted man, right? So uh, irrespective of what happened with Howard, he is wanted for... His, his crimes associated with Walter White, with money laundering, right? So that's stuff that they have actual proof of. They found the shell companies, the nail salons, the laser tag. They found his money down in Antigua and Barbuda. So there's really, th this isn't going to make matters worse for him, this part of the story coming out. And um, as we later hear, Kim say to Cheryl, there's no physical evidence of any of this. And I think um, something interesting about that conversation is when uh, Kim still uh, is protecting Jimmy. And she says that there are no there are no other witnesses um, assuming that her ex-husband is still alive. No remaining witnesses other than my ex-husband, assuming he's still alive. Now, we know and she now knows for sure that Jimmy is alive. In this conversation with Jimmy, the way she ends it and she tells him that she's glad he's alive, I believe her. And I can imagine that, you know, all this time since the news broke, certainly about, you know, what happened with Walter and everything, uh, she thought he was dead. I mean, she was concerned enough that she mentioned it to Francesca when they spoke. She asked if he was alive and Francesca didn't say anything to her. So she was probably dreading the worst. So I think hearing him was um, both a mixture of, of shock and relief and also permission. So then after they hang up the phone, she goes to this little birthday party. And it's also, if you'll remember, it's also Jimmy's birthday, but it's also in a way Kim's rebirth, right? So Jimmy is alive again. Um, she learns that he's actually still alive. So that's a sort of birth, but also it's her coming back to life at this moment. And what follows is uh, Kim reclaiming herself, right? So we see her... Um, land in Albuquerque. And I'm sure most of you probably picked up on the Alaska sign, but there is also right behind the Alaska sign, the frontier sign, Alaska, the final frontier. And um, certainly that's foreshadowing of uh, Jesse's presence, but it also connects Kim and Jesse in an interesting way. And I'll talk more about that when I talk about that specific scene. But there were just a couple of things I wanted to highlight in the the following scenes that, that we, we see. So I mentioned at the, the beginning of this uh, this video that Jimmy's absence was very present. And there are other absences that are glaringly present in the following scene. So like when Kim pulls into the courthouse and we see that the ticket booth is now automated and we are, are very aware of Mike's absence. And then we see um, Kim walk past the picnic table where she and Jimmy sat um, before they got married in um, season five in JMM. 
And then she goes into the the courthouse like she's done a hundred times, puts her bag through uh, the x-ray machine, goes through security. And uh, she as she's waiting for the elevator, she sees a young lawyer that looks a lot like her, right, with a ponytail, putting a tie on her clients. And the absence noted there is Kim, right? So we have Jimmy's absence, um, Mike's absence, uh, the dissolution of their relationship. And then, of course, what she gave up, um, her career, her love of the law. And uh, but she's about to reclaim herself and she pulls up to uh, Cheryl's house. And the way the, the gates part here makes me think of the gates, uh, you know, the pearly gates with St. Peter and Kim is going before Cheryl for judgment. And so she shares the affidavit that she gave to uh, to the DA, who I'm assuming was Suzanne Erickson. Um, she shares that that affidavit with with Cheryl, where she tells the truth about everything that happened to Howard. And Cheryl asks her, "What happens now? Will you go to jail?" And Kim points out that there is no physical evidence. But as Bill Oakley once told us, and as I have remarked pretty much in every single breakdown I've made so far this season, um, thematically, the the idea of proving and the idea of knowing have been prominent, right? And, and Bill Oakley even says that to Jimmy at one point. He says there's proving and there's knowing, right? So they may not be able to prove that any of this actually happens, that Kim and Jimmy ever actually did any of these things. But at least Cheryl now knows. She knows what happened. And um, that is uh, as much for her peace of mind as it is for Kim's peace of mind. And at the end of the conversation, um, Cheryl asks her, why are you doing this? And they cut and we don't actually get to hear her response. And I love that Vince did this for a couple of reasons. One, he leaves it up to us, the audience, to fill in the blank there. But also in the scene on the bus, I think we get our answer. And um, but before I talk about that, just one other thing I wanted to know about this scene with Cheryl that I found so powerful is that we see Kim again and she's um, there's a lot of humility here. Right. But it's also we see Kim. She doesn't look down. She does not avert her eyes. She maintains eye contact with Cheryl. And it's not like in a challenging way. It's just that she's not she's she's looking at this situation she's looking at what she's done directly right like she's not you know hanging her head or trying to avert her gaze um or avoid cheryl's judgment she is sitting before her for this judgment right and um the way she speaks and uh answers the questions um is 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 again to contrast what we saw in those earlier scenes where she's too afraid to actually voice any sort of ideas or opinion um she kind of only really speaks if spoken to and here she is actually speaking she is finally speaking again she has found her voice and she's using it to tell the truth now in this bus scene right so uh gosh i mean the the performances in this episode are incredible incredible they all knocked it out of the park and Ray Seahorn in particular is just amazing from from the first frame that we see her in so, um, oh man, she's just so good. She's so good. And then this, this scene, though, of course, is where we see the catharsis happen and we see the the tears fall, the waterworks. And I love how the, the camera holds on her. And again, like not averting the gaze, right? Like we are, we are forced as viewers to watch her and it's uncomfortable in a way. And, um, I love how like she doesn't actually break though until you can see the bus actually turns a corner if you look through the window. The bus is actually turned and that's when she cries and and perhaps this is when Kim herself turns the corner and she has finally owned up to what she's done. She's finally faced what she's done she, and the tears come flowing out. It is the first time she's allowed herself any real emotion in six years. Oh, God. <laughs> and she lets out this this plea to god oh god as she cries as she turns the corner and i i mentioned this because it is significant in this episode kim is not someone that says oh my god or oh god 
or Jesus or anything like that, you know. So the the religious uh, iconography and symbolism in this episode gives a lot of context to what is happening. So there's a lot you could say about floods and deluges and deserts and stuff like that. And I don't want to go too much into all of that. I mean, that could be like a whole separate video. But there were just a couple of things I wanted to point it, point out here. So um, Kim has has bared her soul, right? And um, she has unburdened her soul. And she is at, at the mercy of, of Cheryl and the court and God. And then in the very next scene, we cut to Jimmy breaking into the cancer guy's house. And there are a couple of things I wanted to point out in this scene. Now, I had mentioned in my previous breakdown that I think Jimmy wants to get caught. And I think that's true. I think he really does want to get caught. He doesn't want to turn himself in, um, but he's acting and behaving so utterly recklessly here that there's really no other explanation for for it, for what he's doing. So the fact that he breaks the glass, right? Um, even if he were able to get in and just get the photos of the documents, like there's evidence of the break-in. The guy might be looking around to see if stuff is missing. And of course he goes and he steals a couple of things. So there's, even with the photos that he takes of the financial documents, they can't use it because the guy's gonna know he's been robbed. So it's nonsensical, it's illogical. And um, but when he first walks in and he hits the piano key and then, um, you know, he's just it's just reckless. And when he's upstairs and he's rooting through the guy's stuff, he lifts up the guy's desk pad and he may have missed it because it happens really quickly. And it's it's at the, the bottom of the frame. There's a crucifix that falls off of the, the desk pad. So this guy has um, perhaps the protection of God, but also maybe Kim's plea, her prayer, also in a way protects Jimmy, right? It protects him from doing or prevents him from doing any any real harm to this guy because he was about to, to hit this guy with cancer in the head with his dead dog's urn, right? Which is so grotesque. It's grotesque beyond, beyond description, really, right? And um, that the guy falls back asleep at just the right moment is um, as much for his own protection as it is also for for Gene's protection, right? It's it's saving his soul from further damnation, if you will. And this this idea of of um, protection, I just wanted to mention one other thing is that in the Marion scene, um, I don't know if you guys noticed, but she has a cross around her neck, so she also has sort of her divine intervention. And then in the scene with Jesse, right, we see um, Jesse and and uh, Kim standing outside of the office and they're having this conversation about Combo. And Jesse recognizes her as the, as the lawyer that defended um, Combo when he stole the little baby Jesus from the nativity scene. But Jesse points out that, you know, he told Combo, you can go to hell for doing this. But you, you got him off scot-free, right? He's saying this to Kim. So this idea of um, the difference between karmic justice um, and man's justice, right? So like God's justice and man's justice, I think comes into play here a little bit. And there's some divine intervention happening. So there's divine intervention in protecting this guy with cancer, there's um, maybe some divine intervention to protect Marion, but there's also divine intervention to stop Jimmy from going too far. So on the on the Insider podcast, when they were talking about the Jesse and Kim scene, they mentioned how like they're both kind of ruined by, by Saul Goodman. And if only they had spoken to each other, maybe Kim could have warned Jesse or something like that. Um, so it is interesting. It is worth noting that these are two characters that survive. And another uh, another similarity between these two characters is that they both confess, right? So Jesse goes to confess to Hank and um, to Gomez about everything that 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 he's done, um, and we see him certainly suffer with the guilt that uh, he he felt. Um, you know, uh, Jesse really, really suffered in Breaking Bad. And we see Kim suffering uh, in, in her life in Florida. And um, 
they both uh, are able to to come clean, right? So whether or not like man's justice will ever hold them accountable, um, who knows? I mean, certainly like if if Jesse is ever caught in Alaska, he will be brought to justice perhaps. And um, we'll have to wait to see if, if Kim will actually be held accountable by the court, by a court of law. But, but both of them have uh, tried to unburden themselves and and confess and tell the truth and uh i think um that that's a, a notable similarity between these these two characters right before uh kim leaves jesse asks her you know is this is the saul goodman any good and kim says when i knew him he was and what a heartbreaking comment that that is and i couldn't help but think of uh uh, Stevie Nicks, when the rain washes you clean, you'll know. And then Kim runs out into the rain, and that's her last moment in this episode. That's her last scene. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the divorce papers uh, signing scene, and it's so brutal. And to imagine that those were the last words that they shared before he calls her in this episode six years later. And it's so obvious that he's hurting, and the cold open as well, like you can hear him bouncing his ball. We know that it's Kim out in the waiting room. It's like around 8 p.m. And um, I, I think she she knows how much he's suffering. And my friends Eliza pointed out that um, this this uh, the scene with the divorce papers reminded her of what it, how he behaved like with the the letter from from Chuck, right? This sort of denial that he goes into. And that he just can't cope with his emotions. And I think it's obvious that he's hurting. And hurt people sometimes lash out and he wants to make him suffer as well in this in this scene. And just a couple more things I wanted to mention um in that final scene with Marion um it's it's a horrifying truly horrifying scene um when she figures out you know who he is and how he rips the phone cord out and come wraps it around his his hands like he's going to choke her. Um he comes towards her and then she grabs her life alert and uh I called it. Um, it's just a uh, horrifying, right? It's horrifying, and um, the the way that the light though of the laptop reflects in his eyes, of course, is a callback to um, the first time we ever see Gene, and he's watching his old commercials, and we see the the reflection of the light in his glasses. But also, it reminded me of a scene that we saw um, in, uh, was it episode nine, with Gus, when we see the fire reflecting in his glasses. So in Gus's case, it was his hatred, um, you know, the audio that he has for specifically for Hector Salamanca. And um, for here, for for Gene here, it's um, the, the, the color of his glory days, right? And another thing I wanted to mention, though, when I was watching the cold open and he's bouncing the ball and it knocks over one of the columns, it's like the fall of the Roman Empire. So um, certainly that's like foreshadowing for the end of their marriage. Um, it could also perhaps be foreshadowing for the end of Saul's empire, maybe also even the end of Jean's run. And another thing I wanted to note was about the watches, right? So in Breaking Bad, we see um, towards the end, Walt takes off the the watch that Jesse gave him for his birthday, and he leaves it on top of the phone booth when he calls um, and pretends that he's a reporter from the New York Times or a photographer from the New York Times, so he can gain, so he can figure out where the the um, where, so he can figure out where Gretchen and Elliot are. And that was a continuity error, right? Because they had shot the um, like a, a cold open earlier in season five of Walt going into the house and um, he wasn't wearing the watch. And that wasn't something that he got gifted until later in the season. So that's why they, they had the watch there. But a lot of people have interpreted that as Walt recognizing that he was out of time. In this scene, Jean steals watches from the cancer guy's house. And then we see them um, back at his house when he's when he's there waiting for um, for Jeff's phone call, and I was uh, thinking about what this might mean, um, and I think it might perhaps mean that he will serve time. Um, I do have a couple of like predictions for what I think might happen in the finale, or what I would hope to see happen in the finale. So I've been chatting with some friends about this, and um, I am of the opinion that because this was such a dark episode. 
And the last couple of episodes have been just so bleak and so dark. And we have seen uh, Jimmy, Jean, whoever, sink to their their lowest, right? And I think that the showrunners have brought us down because they got to bring us back up. And to make it um, a, a satisfying ending, right, if there is going to be any sort of redemption or redemptive arc for this character. And I feel very strongly that he will end up turning himself in. Um, under what conditions, I'm not sure. He might. It might be some sort of creative way of turning himself in. Maybe in some way, like he gets Kim involved. Maybe um, tries to further exonerate her. Um, I don't know about that, but I do think he's going to turn himself in. And had we just seen like regular old, um, you know, boring Gene living his boring Omaha Cinnabon life, just decide to to give up the ghost sort of thing, that would have been very anticlimactic. So instead, like they've shown us um, how he has he's relapsed and gone as dark as he can possibly go. And I think that way, like that way, we'll we'll accept anything like we'll be grateful for an ending where perhaps he doesn't die right so any ending um would be better than leaving it on this dark of a note right like to leave it the way that it is right now would just be too devastating so i i'm hopeful that we will see some sort of redemption for this this character and uh one other thing that i was um thinking about was that we still haven't seen um, Kim's oath right and so I had originally thought that maybe she would like be readmitted to the bar that's what I was kind of hoping for when I first heard that teaser um, and then learned that she quit the law that maybe she would go back to the law but I don't think that's possible now given um, her confession and her affidavit no bar is likely to admit her you know after admitting such horrific misconduct but I was thinking instead it might be a flashback, right? And this isn't like novel. A lot of people figured that this might be a flashback. I was thinking about how in Breaking Bad in the finale, we saw a couple of flashbacks, um, like with Walt and Jesse going out to the desert for the first time. Um, there's a scene with like Walt and Skylar. So I expect we might see something sim similar in uh, Better Call Saul. So I was thinking that an, a way to be able to bring back a lot of the characters would be at Kim's like a uh, swearing in ceremony. So, um, and, and it would be probably really heartbreaking the way that I've, the way it plays in my head, it's sad. So we see Kim getting sworn in and it's a big celebration, right? Cause she was a student while working in the mailroom at HHM. So maybe some of the partners are there. Howard and Chuck could be present. And of course, Jimmy. So we might get a scene where we see all of these characters in happier times. And so um, I hope we see that. I think that would be really, really touching and really moving if we do get a scene like that. And um, I hope that Jimmy and Kim are able to, to speak again. I don't know under what conditions, um, but I, I do hope they get to, to speak again and um have some sort of closure with each other because it's just uh it's just too devastating the way they've they've left these characters and i want closure i need closure and um but i have faith in these in these writers absolutely and i know it's going to be a great finale oh and another thing i wanted to mention before i go was i also uh i was um pleasantly surprised of course that, that kim went to to cheryl and it's crazy because i had in, a, in my um 611 notes and responding to your comments video actually talked about this how i was hoping that that the truth would at least come out to give closure to cheryl and to howard's loved ones right um and just would it's just the right way to end this this story and and to give closure um not just to the howard a uh, storyline but also to give closure to to Kim and hopefully ultimately Jimmy as well because this is such a um, such a stain on them um but when uh Kim mentions that there's no physical evidence but that they will open up an investigation again um I don't know if they're going to find Howard's body I mean like they the feds are already aware of the lab of course after Walt and Jesse burned it down and and Gus died so um, perhaps like they'll get like one of those like little scanner thingies, you, you know, and get down in there and see like if there's anything under the lab, perhaps. 
Um, but I do think that they're they're going to obviously try to follow up on on any leads that they can and in the information that that Kim gave to them in her affidavit. So we saw the the teaser of the esteem, right? And um, just as a little reminder, right, in Bagman, when when Jimmy goes out to the desert to collect the bail money for Lalo, that's when he gets ambushed and um, the car is shot up and then he and Jimmy, he and Jimmy, and then he and Mike push his esteem into the ravine. And then um, later in Bad Choice Road is when Lalo finds the car, of course, right? And um, I think that perhaps if, if the police are out there um, investigating in the desert, because um, now they know that there was some sort of ambush in the desert and his car was perhaps lost out there, maybe they find the car. So maybe that's what that's from. And the the voiceover on that teaser, where it sounds like Jimmy calling Ed or reciting um, the order that you would you would put in to to get Hoovered out. I imagine as soon as he leaves uh, Marion's, he's goes and grabs his diamonds and then is trying to um, get out of Dodge, right? So, so I don't know how they're going to handle that. Like, I don't know if like uh, they're going to get him hoovered out of town or if he's going to have to find another way of escape. Now, I know Robert Forster has passed on, of course, but that doesn't mean that they can't still use that as a character. We don't actually have to hear the phone call. So that could be something that happens. Um so maybe he gets hoovered out of town or not. I'm not really, really sure. I can't imagine him going back into hiding again, though. Um, well, we'll have to see. Maybe he makes his way to Florida. I don't know. I have, I have no idea. But um, let me see. Is there anything else I wanted to say? I have um, my notes here. And one one note that I, I put is that I loved how in the parking lot outside of um, Palm Coast Sprinkler, they showed the heat rating off of heat radiating off of the hoods of the car that was a nice touch if you've ever been to florida you know exactly um how accurate that is we're both too smart to throw our lives away for no reason but then some of my notes here is the way she lives right now is not a life she isn't living she's existing um i'm glad you're alive it's alive like frankenstein um miracle whip of course miracle you have an, again um miracle another sort of uh religious word um also uh when when jimmy calls kim and he said he just wanted to catch up in the way she repeats catch up i thought was kind of a was kind of a cute way to um reference uh mayonnaise and miracle whip again so like catch up like you know let's catch up on you know what we're up to in our lives but also catch up like the condiments so con uh catch up is i think way more exciting than miracle whip maybe um i don't know i don't know if that was <laughs> That was intentional, but it's just something that occurred to me. I'm sure other people have already pointed this out, but the number on um, on the cancer guy's document, $737,612.62, of course, is um, a little callback to Breaking Bad. The amount of money that Walt said he needed uh, to make um, in order to provide for his family, he had figured it down to the dollar. I have no idea what I meant here. When I said tempting the fates. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Another thing um, that I just wanted to mention really quickly um, with the rain and everything, um, especially following the divorce paper scene and then the conversation that, that Kim has with Jesse. I was thinking of the line at the end of 609 with, uh, with Saul sitting at his desk and he says, let justice be done though the heavens fall, right? Which means let justice be done whatever, whatever the consequences um, and again, so like, I, I think the idea of justice has been really important, like, like the characters, different sense of justice. And we've seen this play out in a couple different episodes before. So like justice as revenge, justice as like, you know, some sort of moral rights, um, justice in terms of the law. So all these different senses of or iterations of, of justice, right? Um, and then also, though the heavens fall, could also be like the rain. Um, Jimmy mentions to Kim when when he calls her, you know, I hope I'm catching you in between hurricanes, right? And that um, that scene is sort of sandwiched between like the scene with her boyfriend where they're like, it looks like rain again. And then we see her crying and then also the Jesse scene with the with the rain. So she's in between um, emotional storms, right? So like, and the the water is, is marking the sort of emotional storm. So um, 
just yeah so kind of half-baked ideas there i haven't really thought all that stuff too much through and that's pretty much all i wanted to say about it but when kim is in her office typing um up a description of like a sprinkler part she writes heralding an exciting new chapter so um again i think that just to, to sort of highlight just how drab and um sort of banal her life has become you know like the exciting new chapter in sprinkler technology and uh just a few other things a lot of again some more fish references and of course like um that's another sort of religious um i piece of iconography so kim is eating a tuna sandwich um and something else interesting in that little lunch scene with her co-workers is they're talking about crack so again thinking of like presences and absences and stuff like that so the mention of crack how could kim not think of howard and you know the whole cocaine story and stuff like that um and then of course the two cops sitting out in front um of the cancer guy's house one of them is eating a uh fish taco and um one guy, the other cop mentions to him, you know, um, why would you order fish when you're like 1400 miles away from the nearest ocean? And that reminded me of a line from Breaking Bad. There's a scene where like uh, the family, um, uh, including Hank and Marie are over for dinner and like everyone has like their own takeout and Marie is eating some sort of fish. And um, and I, I don't remember exactly what episode it is. Maybe one of you do. Um, but Hank says to her, you know, all I'm saying is that like you're two days away from the nearest ocean, right? Um, or two days. Yeah, you're a two day drive away from like the nearest ocean and you're eating fish or something. Um, something to that effect. So it was a nice little callback there. Um, yeah, so I think that that really is it. I'm going to end it now. So as always, I would love to hear your thoughts. What did you think about this episode? What are your predictions for the, the finale? What do you think is going to happen? I think he's going to get caught. Um, I actually think he's going to turn himself in or have someone else turn him in, perhaps. Um, I hope he doesn't die. I would be kind of surprised and, to be honest, disappointed if he dies. Um, it would have to be like, I don't know. They, I don't want him to die but we'll, we'll just have to wait and see so yes I, I would love to hear your thoughts what do you think is going to happen um drop your your comments um below i can't believe this is um kind of the last time i'm going to be able to to predict anything about the show um but it's super excited to hear that vince gilligan is working on a, another series and it's more um, more like something like the X-Files or even more like the Twilight Zone, which is like right up my alley. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, yeah, so I, I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. And um, yeah, Monday. All right. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.